You know, it's one thing for my lips to sing about how great God is, but it's another thing to kind of apply his greatness to my own situation. For example, I know for years I always struggled, well, you know, God's great, so that means his love is great. Well, what is, is his love great towards me, though? In light of what I've done and in light of all of my failures, you know, is, is his love really great towards me? And then when we've struggled for provision in life, you know, it's easy to sing about his greatness and his ability to provide, but then sometimes it's, it's hard to, by faith, say he's going to provide for me. Amen? So... As I was singing and thinking about those songs, I was just hoping and praying, Lord, help us to believe that you are great and to believe that because of your grace, you are great in every way for me because I know how difficult sometimes that is. But anyway, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians is where we are. Again, looking at Paul's first letter to the believers that were living in this city. You can actually visit there today, interestingly enough. I've never been there. Maybe one day. In Paul's day, there were about 200,000 people that lived there. This city was a key commercial and political hub along this great highway known as the Via Ignatia. Okay, today there are actually 300,000 people that live there. It's one of the few cities that actually survived from the New Testament era. And we've already read it. We're not going to read it again. But if you want to understand the background and the genesis of this particular congregation of believers, you can go back and read Acts chapter 7 verses 1 through 15 that talks about As Paul was going around on his missionary journeys, it talks about the time when he stopped into this city and preached the gospel there and kind of gives you a little background of how it all started. But we ask, why would Paul, who is now gone and separated from these believers, why would he write to them? Well, there are several reasons, but one of those reasons is that these people were new believers and he wanted to assure them. Because you got to think, if you go back and read the background, Paul had to leave town immediately. You know, when the opposition rose up, he had to get out out of town quick. So a lot of people probably thought that he had deserted them. Paul's enemies, the opposition was attacking him and his character. And so Paul wanted to write them and assure him of his love and assure them uh, of, of who he truly was and to remind them of the kind of man and the kind of people that they were when they were among them. So he wanted to assure them of several things, but he also wanted for these new believers to be grounded in the truth. I think it's very interesting. Why would Paul even want to go back? Because he talked several times about how he wanted to go to them, but the Satan had hindered him. And why would even Satan care about him going back? Like he's already got them to make the decision and believe. So what's so important about you getting back there, right? Well, Paul understood his mission. You following me? Paul understood that the mission wasn't just to get people to make decisions for Christ. The mission was to make disciples for Christ. And so it wasn't just Paul going in and preaching, right? And then taking up an offering and then checking out of town, right? Paul wanted to get back. And think about, well, I mean, again, why, why would Satan not want Paul to go back? Well, he would just assume that people be young all the time and immature. He doesn't want to see them grow up in the faith and mature in the faith. And he certainly doesn't want their life to become fruitful. He doesn't want them to now turn around and be a blessing for others. So he wrote to them because he wanted them grounded in the truth. He wanted to see them mature and be fruitful in their walk and in their witness. And he knew that they were suffering. He knew that the opposition that he had just left was now what they were faced with. And think about that. That, that, is, that, is, that applies to us. Because I don't know if you've noticed it, but for those of us who are serious about what God has said in his word, those of us who are serious about living out our faith, it seems like the opposition is gradually getting and growing in our land, even here in America. So maybe one of the reasons God wants us to be here and studying what we're studying is so that we understand and know how to live in times of opposition and persecution as well. But we'll trust him to apply it how he wants to apply it. But he wants to see them endure through it. He wants to see them thrive. And ultimately, again, he wanted to fulfill the mission, which was to make disciples. Today, we're going to look at chapter 2. 
And I want to begin reading at verse 13, going to read down through verse 16. So when you have that, let's stand today really ultimately as just a simple statement that we're not reading the word of man. We're reading the word of God. Amen. Let's do that. First Thessalonians chapter number two, beginning at verse number 13. Paul says, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God who are in Judea in Christ Jesus. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Judeans who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets and have persecuted us. And they do not please God and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. You may be seated. In these verses, Paul talks about one of the resources that God has given us to walk, to live in victory no matter what the circumstances might be. So you're tracking with me? God talks about one of the resources that he has given us so that we can walk in victory no matter what the circumstances might be. He begins in verse 13 by thanking God for essentially the relationship that these people at Thessalonica have with the word of God. He talks, he's he's like, God, I thank you. And he does it all the time, thanking them for, for their relationship to God's word. We could ask today this of ourselves to apply it. What is your relationship to the Bible? What is your relationship to the Bible? Because we believe that this is not words from man. This is God's word to us. So what is your relationship to the Bible. Truthfully, the way one treats the written word, the Bible is really a reflection of how they regard Jesus who is the living word of God. Because you have the written word and then you have the word of God that became flesh and dwelt among us to literally show us a living example of God's word. Both the living word and the written word are called bread. They're called a light. They are both referred to as the truth, just to emphasize the importance of both. If you look at the Bible, the Bible teaches us that the Holy Spirit gave birth to Jesus through a holy woman. Holy woman just simply meaning a woman that was set apart to have a baby as a virgin. I'd say that's pretty holy, wouldn't you say? I don't mean holy and perfect. That's not why God chose her. Mary was a sinner just like you and I. But God set her apart to be the one who would carry in her womb the Son of God and give birth to the Savior of the world. That's a special purpose. Amen? But We don't put the focus there. We put the focus on the Savior Jesus who was born. But yet the Holy Spirit brought all of this about as well as the written word that we know from reading the Bible that the Holy Spirit also gave birth to the written word through, as Peter would say, through holy men. And so God chose, selected, set apart certain individuals just like us to be those whom he would speak to and have record, write down what he says. And so the Holy Spirit who moved those men has given us the opportunity to hold in our hands the word of God today. What a blessing. And just as Jesus, the written word, is the eternal son of God, also the Bible is the eternal word of God that lives and abides forever. People can say what they want about truth and about what God's word says, but it's always been here. It always will be here forevermore. That's just the way it is. It is God's truth. So I want to talk to you this morning about their relationship with God's Word and ask you about yours. So I want to give you several things that describe their relationship to the Word of God. Number one, they respected the Word of God. 
They respected the word of God. In other words, they, they valued the word of God. Go back to chapter 2, verse 13. Paul says, for this reason, we thank God without ceasing because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us. So it says they received the word of God, which they heard from us. That word received there means to accept from another. It simply is a word that describes hearing with the ear. In other words, when Paul was speaking, as you will read in Acts 17, what did he do? When he began to speak to them and to show them that Jesus or that the Christ, the Messiah, was the Savior of the world, what did he open in Acts 17? He opened the Scriptures. And he used the Scriptures to explain and demonstrate that the Christ, the Messiah, had to suffer, that he had to die and rise again because they were confused about it all, right? They thought Messiah was going to show up, go into Jerusalem, set up his kingdom, and everything was going to be great. They would be freed from the Roman bondage and that they would rule and reign with him. That was their mindset. And so when Jesus started talking about suffering, dying, rising again, they were confused. And so when Paul wanted to clear up the confusion, what did he use? The Bible. See, the Bible is so important because it unlocks the truth for really the most important question for every one of us in this room. And that is, how does a person get saved? That's what the Bible does for us. It unlocks that truth. It shows us how to be saved and how to have a relationship with God. They respected this and they, they, they valued this because it says there in the text, they didn't, when Paul opened the scriptures, they weren't looking at this as a word of man. They were looking at this as the word of God. And you can see that down in verse 13 where it says they welcomed it not as the word of men but as it is in truth the word of God in other words they didn't immediately tune it out how many of you have somebody that maybe you work with or maybe it's a family member that as soon as they start talking you tune them out because you absolutely don't respect and want to hear anything they got to say anybody like that some of you are like that with me, probably. I still wonder why you keep showing up and wasting your time every week. I'm joking with you. But it means they didn't immediately turn them, turn them, tune them out. Others did. Because immediately when Paul started describing the Messiah as something that didn't match up with what the Messiah was in their mind, they didn't want to hear what he had to say. In essence, they didn't want to hear what God had to say. During my time in college, I can't tell you how many times I heard somebody say this. Come on, Matt. Don't you know that the Bible is just another book? I mean, I can still literally see their faces. I, I told the students this morning, one day, I was at, when I was at State, I was, I was writing uh, on a piece of paper in my notes. Somebody had asked a question. I wasn't really interested in their question or what the professor had to say about it. So I was kind of over here doodling. And so there were a couple of verses that I was memorizing. And so I said, well, I, I'll take a moment just to write them out in my notes just to kind of think about it, right? So as I'm doing that, I had a friend who elbowed me and he looked at me and said, dude, what are you doing? And I just kind of went on about my business. But after it was all over with, he came up to me and he said, man, don't you know that the Bible is just a normal book? Don't you know that the Bible is nothing but just man's opinion of what they believe happened and took place and what they think about God? And I'll never forget that. But I heard that over and over and over. It's funny to me, and I've seen this in 20 years, and you take kids that grow up in church and they've been taught this and all of a sudden they go to college and they get woke all of a sudden and now I become the enemy. And now every single person that believes in the Bible and talks about God, now you are the enemy because now they have got with all the smart people of the world and they have figured it all out. Because I know what happens. I know how the enemy uses that educational system to basically put you in a position 
to begin to doubt what God has said. And, and I think we know that that's, this is exactly how the enemy has done what he's done from the very beginning. With that age-old question, did God really say? Because if he can get you to doubt the validity of what we're reading and doubt whether this is what God has said or not, man, that's where, that's where he gets you. You can choose to believe that if you want to. You can say, oh, it's just another book. But that's not true because anybody, and I've done it for 20 years, anybody who's willing to actually read it and actually study it will find very quickly that God's fingerprints are all over it. It's a miracle book. I mean, just the fact that God would say something a thousand years before it ever would happen. And then the fact that it would come about, not just like in a general way so that we would know it was connected. But we're talking about like in a very specific way, exactly how God said it would happen. It's not just another book, ladies and gentlemen. It's the word of God. And that's how they related to it they respected it they valued it it's called the holy bible for a reason because each one of these words were god breathed according to paul men did play a huge role in it but they spoke as peter would say they were moved along by the holy spirit just as the wind would fill a sail and move that boat that's exactly what god did because we're prone to mislead and deceive. We are. How many of you men have ever went fishing? Or maybe you uh, ladies have even been fishing. And literally, you went and you caught one fish. And it was, honestly, it was that long. But you got back and somebody said, hey, did you catch anything? And you said, oh, oh, yeah, man, we caught. Well, how big was it? And then it went from this to this. Right? It wasn't this. It was really this. Right? So that's, that's who we are. So it's like, well, how could we trust the Bible if man, man had his hand in it, right? Here's how you trust the Bible. Because the whole time, God had man in his hand. That's how you trust it. That's how you trust it. David says God's word is holy, it's pure, it's perfect. David says it's more to be desired than, than gold. I know your job is important. I know... Money's important for, for living and these things, but, but David is saying that like what God says is more important than all the riches of the world. Because what God says is life, just like the disciples. Jesus started teaching. He started about drinking blood and eating flesh. Well, that, he didn't mean that literally. Where everybody kind of took it literally like, man, I'm out of here. I don't want anything to do with this. And so his disciples were just sitting there and Jesus said, well, are y'all going to leave too? And you remember what they said? Remember what they said? They said, we can't because you have the words of life. The words of life. So that's why it's more to be desired than all the riches of the world. It's more to be desired as Job would say in Job 23, 12, more than food. More than my daily nourishment, man, I need the word of God. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The word is referred to as milk and honey, it's, or excuse me, as milk and meat. It's also called honey in the Bible. Spiritually for our spirit, man, it's our nourishment. So what is your relationship with the word of God. Do you respect it? Do you, do you value it? Because you see, if you and I want to stand in victory through all of life's circumstances, if we want to maintain a joy through all of life's circumstances, then we must respect and value this book above all things. I'm not calling you to worship the Bible. We worship Jesus, the written word, but we understand this is a way that God primarily speaks to us so you understand the importance of that relationship. As a matter of fact, how are you even going to get to know God apart from reading his word where he has told us who he is and how he operates? I want you to think just with me for a moment of how precious it is that God has spoken. One of the guys in our Sunday school class this morning just kind of posed the question, could you imagine life with no Bible at all? 
No Bible. No truth. Imagine the confusion. Everybody just spouting off what they think and what they think is right. But we do have the word. I don't have to be confused. I don't have to live in the dark. I remember the time of my life when I could not even get settled on whether or not I was saved or whether or not I was even a child of God. I was, I was struggling with that. And it seemed like the more people I would ask, the more confused I got. And so I'll never forget one day I went back to my apartment. I got on my knees and I said, God, there is no way that you want me to wander around in this world or live in this life wondering whether you're my father or not. Listen, there's not a day that's gone by that I've ever doubted whether Ray Rummage is my father or not. Not one day. Not one day. Nor has he ever told me to do something that I said, well, I'm going to do this because i got to be Ray Rummage's son. Not one time has that ever happened. Because I know that. I'm like, God, if I know who my earthly daddy is, surely you want me to know who my heavenly daddy is, right? But the more I asked people, the more confused I got. So I finally had to make a decision. My decision was, okay, God, I'm going to ask you. What a great idea, Matt. Now, I'm not being critical of you, but for some of you, that would be a huge step for you to just make that transition of, you know what, God? I'm just going to ask you what you think. And I'm going to open this book and I'm going to read it. Until I get the answer and the peace that I need. And two months later, that happened for me. One of the greatest days of my life when God clarified that truth for me. And I can honestly tell you, and God is my witness, I, I, haven't, I haven't lived a single day since then in doubt of who my Heavenly Father is. And when I say that, that blows people away because they're like, man, you know. But I understand it's God's gift. It's not something I'm working for, striving for, trying to earn. It's God's gift to me. And, and listen, if I'm any example to you at all, let me be this example to you. Just receive the gift, amen? Just take it. I know it might sound too good to be true, but praise God, it is true because everything he gives, he freely gives. They respected, they valued the word of God to you. Or is your Bible just something that, hey, and again, I'm loving you on this. It's hard to say this, but is your Bible just something sitting around like everything else collecting dust? I mean, let's be honest. Because it's great that you're here. I love the fact that you're here. I love the fact that you put yourself in position to hear somebody teach the word. But what about every day? You don't just eat one time a week. You eat every day. You nourish yourself. You take care of yourself. So just asking that question, do you respect and value the Word of God? Number two, Paul highlights the fact that they didn't just respect it, but they welcomed the Word of God. Here's what's cool about the, the text. Look at verse 13. Paul says, hey, we thank God without ceasing because when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, notice what he says, you welcomed it. Now, your text might actually use the same English word. It might use the word receive twice. But what you need to know is that it's a different Greek word, okay? The New Testament was written, majority of it was written in Greek. And so every English word underneath it, it has a Greek word. And so underneath is a different word than the word he used previously that we just looked at when it says you receive the word. Here he talks about how they welcome the word. So there's two different words. The first, remember, is to hear with the ear. The second is to hear it, but to welcome it in. How many people have come knocking on your door and you did not want them in your house? Any, any, anybody that's ever happened to you? Somebody came knocking them on your, on your door. They, they, they maybe wanted to come in, but you absolutely did not want to welcome them into your house. That ever happened? Maybe it's a family member. And you're like, oh, no. But they welcomed it. So, so here's what you're seeing is like, they didn't just immediately tune Paul out because Paul opened the book. He preached to them the word of God, right? So they didn't immediately tune him out because they understood it was a word of God, not the word of man. So they actually heard what he had to say. But then once they heard what he had to say, guess what they did? Because the word was going, 
That's what the Word was doing. The Holy Spirit knocking on their heart. But they didn't just shut it out of their mind. What did they do? They opened the door and they welcomed the Word of God now down into their heart. That's what they did. But how many of us, when it comes to our relationship with the Word, we hear it, but yet we don't like it or it's inconvenient and we're just like, eh. You don't even go to the door. You don't answer the door because you know that if you welcome what God says, in you, it's going to change your life. You may have to lose some friends. Things might get a little uncomfortable if you get serious about walking with God. I tell you what, I don't know you, but let me just use myself because I know me pretty doggone good. And there have been many times when I knew God's Word and God's Spirit were knocking on the door of my heart, but I absolutely refused to open the door. Whether it was because I liked my sin and I was enjoying my sin at the time, or whether it was just going to be inconvenient or it was going to make me uncomfortable. Whatever the reason was, I'm just being transparent. There have been many times when I've said, I'm not going to the door. Oh, I heard it. Man, did I hear it. I heard it clearly, but I didn't welcome you. See, Paul's saying, I don't ever stop thanking God because when I look at your relationship to the Word, you didn't just hear it, but you took it in. You took it in. How hard is that? You hear me open the book every week, but how many of us, man, were like, the Word's going, but you're like, I ain't going there kind of like that family member or that neighbor that's going hey need to borrow something you're like go away honey turn out the lights what I came to realize is that's really what repentance is all about because repentance what the New Testament word means is to change your mind And so repentance happens when you know or or when you're confronted with God's truth and you know that you're not believing that truth, but yet you make the decision to say, okay, God, what I'm believing is not right. I'm going to now start believing and think the way you want me. That's repentance. That's repentance. And see, that's the beauty of how your relationship with God starts. It's when you recognize, I can't. I can't do this. I cannot save myself. I can't hold on to this lie that, you know what, when I die, I just hope that I've been a good enough person. That's the lie. And so for me, I had to get rid of the lie and accept the truth that what God gives, he freely gives, and that Jesus through his life, death, burial, and resurrection completely paid for me to have a relationship with him. So I had to get rid of the lie. I had to accept the truth. Listen, this is where compassion comes out. I understand that for some of us, when we get confronted with the truth, man, that it's difficult because we start thinking, oh my goodness, I may have to do this, I may have to do this, I may actually have to say I'm sorry, or I may actually have to get out of a bad relationship, or I may have to, you know, maybe just realize I shouldn't do this. I've got to walk with God. I thought of this and we'll move on. Acts 26 verse 28, you can go back and read this some other time, but it describes the encounter that the Apostle Paul had with a man named King Agrippa. King Agrippa is a great example of this. Paul shared the gospel with King Agrippa. And you know what King Agrippa said at the end? He said, Paul, you almost persuade me. So here's what I know. The king clearly heard what Paul told him, but here's where he messed up. He didn't welcome it in. He didn't take it. He didn't say that's what I believe and what I live, which leads me to the next thing. They not only respected and valued the word, they also also welcomed it, but then last of all, They believed it. They obeyed it. They believed, they obeyed the word of God. Look what it says there at the end of verse 13. Again, Paul is thanking God. 
without ceasing because when they received the word of God which you heard from us you welcomed it not as the word of men but as it is in truth the word of God and notice the last phrase which also effectively works in you who believe so what you got to establish here is what's effectively working it's the word it's the word of God and so here's the beautiful part about this the phrase who what at the end what's the last two words who believe so who does the word of God effectively work in it's those who believe it right it's what it says so is the word of God ever going to work inside and and transform the life of one who hears it but never welcomes it no is it going to transform the life of one who will never ever go to the door who just tunes it out immediately like there goes that guy again opening that bible don't he understand that the bible's just another book don't he understand that it's just what man wrote and it's what man thinks i mean is that person ever going to be transformed no but the reality is for those who hear it those who welcome it and believe it like actually obey it the bible says that the word of god releases a powerful energy in their lives. You see, when we believe what God says, he releases this power, this energy that works in our lives to fulfill his purpose in us and through us. One of the great examples of this is Luke chapter 17. And if you want to, you can turn there with me. And we're about to shut her down here, but I want you to see this illustration from Luke chapter 17 verse 11 it's about 10 lepers I talked about this midweek on Wednesday night so just listen to the story it happened as he Jesus went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee then as he entered a certain village there met him 10 men who were lepers but they stood afar off they lifted up their voices and they said Jesus master have mercy on us so when he saw them he said to them go show yourselves to the priest now what's interesting about that is that that was what a leper was supposed to do once he was already clean that was what he was supposed to do when he was already clean but Jesus gave a clear word go show yourself to the to the priest now notice what it says right after that and so it was that as they went that what happened they were cleansed you, do you see what happened Jesus spoke very clearly go show yourself to the priest they wanted help oh please be mercy go show yourself to the priest well, Jesus, uh, wasn't that what we were supposed to do when we go back to Leviticus and, and, and when we were already clean? Like, come on now. Let's, let's deal with this and then we'll deal with this. Let's don't get the ox before the, or the cart before the ox, however that saying goes. But they heard what he said. They welcomed it. They didn't call him a fool for saying that. And they did what he said. And what happened? There was a power that was released. And as a result, they were cleansed. See, there's a lot of times in my life I'm saying, God, please give me peace. Oh, God, please, will you give me peace? And then God speaks something to me. And then I kind of shrug it off and I go back to trying to work for my own peace, right? Well, God, in his grace, he speaks again. And this time I'm like, okay, God, I got you. But then I'm like, well, that might be for everybody else, but not me. (laughs) Well, then he speaks again. And I'm like, okay, God, maybe that is for me because you've made it pretty clear this time. And then you welcome that promise in to your heart. Or you do what God tells you to do. And all of a sudden, what happens? Peace shows up. But here's what I found out about our lives. We're wanting all of God's gifts, but we still want to live life our way. Oh, God, give me peace, but... I'm still going to hold on to my sin and do what I've always done. The point is that's not what's, that's not the way it works. It's not the way it works. And I love John 11 and you can go home or you can go online to hear the study from Wednesday. But 
And the context of that is Lazarus' death. And you remember the story, Martha, Mary, they come out to Jesus and they're like, Jesus, why did you wait so long? Like, why, did, why didn't you show up when, when Lazarus was sick? Well, now he's dead and in, insinuating, now it's over. There's nothing that can be done. And do you remember what Jesus said to her? Jesus said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. Though he dies, will live. And then he said to her, he said, he who believes in me will never die. And here's the question that he asked her. Do you believe this? Martha, you see in the future that there's going to be a resurrection, but do you believe and know who I am? I am the resurrection. Like, do you believe that I can do something now, that it's not too late, that even though this man is dead, that I can make him alive? Do you believe this? And what Jesus is trying to get at is that when we're born into this world, we're all spiritually dead. And I tell you what, Jesus better be able to raise the dead or there's nobody in this room or in the world that's going to have hope. And then he demonstrated it. And even though a man had been dead for four days and his body started to smell, Jesus hollered to him, Lazarus, come forth. And you know what he did? He came out. And he came out alive. There's some of you, God is saying, come forth. Come out of that death. Come out of that, that life that you're living. And truly live and believe in me. Come out of that. But you're like, ah, I'll get to that tomorrow. I'll get to that. I, you know, I, I'm just not ready for that right now. But he's saying, come out. And you're already worried about how you're going to get the grave clothes off before anything else. But they believed. And as they believed what God said, there was a power, there was an energy. The Word of God effectively works in you who believe. So the question to all of us is, do you believe what God is saying? Do you believe what he said about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? Do you believe it was enough to put you in a right relationship with God? Do you believe God's promises that he's never going to allow the righteous to be begging for bread? Do you believe it? Do you believe that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do you believe that he will never leave you nor forsake you to believe that? Do you believe that his grace is always sufficient? Do you believe these things? That, that's really the question. So I found that for really for all of us, you know what we're really struggling with? We're struggling with faith. Faith. Because God through his son Jesus has already done it all. It's just a matter of whether I'm going to take the fruit of what he's done and receive it as a gift to me. But I'm saying this, I know it's a struggle. Why do you think Paul had to tell Timothy, fight the good fight of faith? Is this a struggle every day? Satan doesn't want you to believe because faith is where the victory is. Faith is the victory for your, your life. Over your personal struggles. Faith is the victory for your family. Faith is the victory for you as a parent of your kids. For your job, for your future, for your retirement, for everything. Faith is really the key to it all. So what about you? We've just read about the relationship that the church at Thessalonica had with the word. But what about you? Do you respect it? Do you value the word of God or is it just kind of sitting over there like something else collecting dust? When you hear it, do you welcome it in? Do you receive it? And last of all, are we walking in it? Are we believing it and doing what God is telling us to do? I know what it's like to be confronted with that and I know how inconvenient it can be. And I know that it can make the one who believes the word of God look like an absolute fool sometimes. I know that. But here's what I know. At the end of the day, I'm not standing before the judgment seat of Kelly Sigmund or Brad Oswald. I'm going to stand before the judgment seat 
of Jesus Christ. And I can't even begin to tell you how much peace that gives me because I really, and y'all pray for me, I'm at a good place because I really don't care what people think. Because I, I'm going to live and be led as God leads me to do the right things, right? Regardless of what the world has to say about it because I just know when it comes to the end that that person is not going to be the one there judging me and determining what I did was right or whether it was wrong. And no, I'm not perfect. Thank God for those of you that have been gracious to me because none of us are. But in the end, I can just promise you that your walk with God, your obedience to God, every single last bit of it will be worth it all and it will be rewarded. So you just go and conclude what will be the case for those who tune him out and just do their own thing. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity that we enjoy to gather in this building, in this place, as your church, the people, to open this blessed book, the Word of God, to read it, to, to, to talk about it, to preach on it. And so, God, I'm, I'm thinking first and foremost about anybody that would be here today that is unsure about their relationship with you. I'm praying that the truth of their sin and their need for the Savior Jesus, the one who came, who lived, who suffered, who died, was buried, and rose again, the one who ascended with the promise that he's coming back, that they would come to the realization that Jesus is that Savior, that they would transfer their faith from themselves to believe in Christ and Christ alone, and to know that it is a free gift. I pray that even now they're praying and they're crying out and they're receiving that wonderful gift of salvation, that relationship with you. Father, I pray for us as believers. There are too many dusty Bibles. It's time to dust them off. It's time to get back to our respect and value of what you have said. It's time to begin welcoming it instead of ignoring it and running from it. And it's time to start walking in this word. This is how we live in victory despite the circumstances. God, help us never forget what we have heard today because times that we are facing are perilous times as you told us. And we just do not know what's ahead for the next day. God, help us in Jesus' name. We pray, amen. Would you stand with me as we...